Well, thank you very much for including me in this program. Uh, it's a pleasure to participate, even if even if um, only remotely via video link. Um, what I'd like to do is to ever so briefly share some of our research on the interconnected influence of deficit debt and demography and the implications for investors, specifically for the ETF community. What I'd like to do is to draw your attention first to Exhibit 3 in the materials. I believe you have control there on your end of the slides. This is the world map slide. And what this does is to show the scale of debt, sovereign debt, worldwide measured relative to the economic footprint of various countries around the world uh, in the global economy. And of course, Japan is bright red, massive debt burden, more than twice the world average relative to the size of their economy. You can see Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, all bright red, all looking to be bailed out by Germany, which is bright red. So Germany can't bail anyone out. They're deeply, deeply in debt. The U.S. is a lighter red, 50 to 100 percent above the world average, but only because we use more aggressive fraudulent accounting than the rest of the developed world. If we look to the next exhibit, Exhibit 4, we can see that uh, John Maynard Keynes' counsel for all of this was, if you've got yourself in a slow growth problem, borrow a little more, spend a little more, and revive the animal spirits of the private sector. And lo and behold, the uh, tangible evidence on uh, Keynes' uh, uh, views is overwhelmingly negative. When you look at 30 countries spanning 30 years of data, uh, incremental spending that boosts the external debt of a nation winds up going hand in hand with uh, slower macroeconomic growth, uh, becoming downright negative growth if the growth in debt is fast enough. Uh, if you pose the question, well, doesn't increased debt at least improve growth in the second year or third year or fourth year out. No, if I were to show graphs for subsequent years growths, uh, you'd find exactly the same relationship, just a little less pronounced in the out years. So Keynes quite simply was wrong. He is popular in the corridors of power because he's the one respected economist who says big government's a good thing. Looking uh, at exhibit five, we can see this runs headlong into a demographic challenge. The graph on the left on Exhibit 5 shows the population profile for the G8 economies, the eight largest developed economies in the world from 1950 to 2050. And you can see on the far left, each band represents a five-year age cohort. The bottom band was the biggest. Um, zero to five years old, excuse me, zero to four years old, and that was the baby boom. And you can see that bump ripples up and to the right to become a huge surge in septuagenarians in the not too distant future. You can see the top two bands on the graph, which represent 65 and up, the senior citizens of the world, uh, were 9% of the G8 population back in 1950. They're 17% today. A transition from 9 to 17% in the space of 60 years is a nice gradual transition, fairly easily absorbed, but it goes from 17% to 26% in the next 20 years. That's a jarring transition. It'll be uh, a game changer politically for the macro economy and for the capital markets. The line across the middle shows the median age of the population. You can see on the far left, there's six bands below the midpoint. That means the median age was 30, and it stayed there for almost 30 years, then gradually rose to a current median age of 41. It's slated to continue rising to about 45 by mid-century. The bricks are a very different picture. Back in 1970, there were four bands below the midpoint, meaning that half the population of the BRICS was teenagers or younger. No wonder these economies were such a mess. No wonder they were politically so unstable. Anyone in the audience who's had first-hand experience with teens 
can probably readily attest that an economy built on a foundation of teenagers is not likely to be very politically stable or uh, very economically efficient. And you can see the transition over the next 30 years takes them from median age of 30 to median age of 40, exactly the transition that the G8 had over the last 60 years. So from a demographics perspective, the BRICS will be squarely in the demographic sweet zone for GDP growth, much as the G8 was over the last 60 years. We did some work that was published in 2012 in the uh, Financial Analyst Journal in which we found a very powerful link between uh, demography and GDP growth shown on Exhibit 6. And what you can see on this exhibit is that, that the link is prim primarily for ages 20 to 44. The BRICs are coming into that sweet spot. The developed world is exiting that sweet spot. And the implications of this are actually very straightforward. If you look at Exhibit 7, we can actually trace the portion of GDP growth that would be attributable to demography alone. And what we can see here, the, the blue line is for the G8, the um, uh, green line is for the United States, and you can see 50 to 100 basis points per year outsized GDP growth attributable solely to demography over much of the last 60 years, especially the second half of the 20th century. The China, the uh, banded red line and the BRICS, the dark single red line, um, also enjoyed a tailwind that really only started in the mid to late 80s. They were too young a population to enjoy rapid growth before that. Um, they came into their own uh, back in the late 80s and they'll be in that sweet spot for a while longer. Then we come into a period of abnormally low GDP growth as populations age and as we enter a period of time when the labor force grows slower than the population creating a drag on GDP and when the working age population gets older. Why does the working age population getting older matter? Because young adults are the ones who have rapid growth in productivity. It's not that old, older workers are unproductive. They're not. People reach peak productivity typically in their 50s. But in your 50s, you wind up, if you're at peak productivity, with stable productivity. Your contribution to GDP is wonderful. Your contribution to GDP growth is nothing. When you're a young adult, your contribution to GDP is more moderate, less impressive, but your contribution to GDP growth is awesome as your productivity is soaring. And so that's the transition that we see coming. And you can see China has some serious problems coming after 2030. So it's a ways out. People talk about the great demographic wall of China. It's, it's 15 to 20 years out, but it's coming. Meanwhile, we're already in the early stages of a major slowdown in normal GDP growth. There's nothing wrong with it. If we expect slower growth, we're going to be fine. Uh, I gave our demography work a presentation in Vienna, and somebody in the audience uh, during the Q&A stood up and said, uh, I'm from the Netherlands. We peaked in relative uh, affluence and, and relative wealth 400 years ago. And we've had slow growth ever since. I can tell you, slow growth with an affluent base is not a bad thing. So it's, uh, it's actually not a dismal story at all. It just means that we've had our easy growth and that the growth ahead is likely to be slower. If we're ready for it, if we brace for it, if we expect it, we're going to be fine. So those are the headwinds that we face. Now, when, when it comes to forward-looking returns, past is not prologue. The easiest evidence of that is on Exhibit 10. Bonds in the United States have had a 30-year return of 8%. How many people really think that we're likely to get 8% from bonds in the coming years? Of course not. The yield is 2.5. The yield and the subsequent return, the yield is in blue. 
the subsequent return is in gold, the yield and the return are joined at the hip. Uh, they're rarely more than 1% apart. And so what we find is past is not prologue. Building blocks of return are what matters. So when we look at stocks, take a look at Exhibit 11. For UK investors, the developed yield, the FTSE developed yield is 2.6%. Real earnings growth, the long-term average real earnings growth for the FTSE developed index has been 1% over and above inflation. UK inflation, uh, break-even inflation is 27 which puts reasonable uh, return expectations at about, about a 6% uh, return. So if we're likely to get 2 to 3 from our bonds and 6 from our stocks, we'd better ratchet down our return expectations. Again, it's, it's not a, a terrible story. It just means that return expectations need to be more grounded. Does that mean that there aren't opportunities? No, it does not. There's lots of opportunities. Take a look at Exhibit 12. Um, the developed economies of the world, debt to GDP is 77%. For the G5, it's 117%. For emerging markets, it's 39%. Half that of the developed world, a third that of the G5. And yet the yield to maturity is 300 basis points higher. Well, isn't the yield higher because the credit is so much worse? Not really. The credit is single A versus double A on average. Well, isn't it higher because the default risk is much higher? Well, you can insure against default risk using a credit default swap. Credit default swaps for the developed economies will cost you 80 basis points, leaving you a net yield of only one, way below the rate of inflation and negative real yield. For emerging markets, you pay 30 basis points more. That sounds like free money. You pay 30 basis points more to insure against default in order to pocket 300 basis points more yield. Why, isn't, why aren't the investment banks all over this arbitrage? It's very simple. Investment banks don't like five-year arbitrages. It's not a pretty picture to put on a five-year arbitrage and then wait five years to cash in. Take a look at Exhibit 13, another very interesting uh, bifurcation. We're looking at U.S. equities with a Schiller P.E. ratio of 23 and a half. Very expensive by historical standards. And Wall Street says, never mind the Schiller P.E. ratio. We're at a new earnings base. The old earnings troughs don't matter. You don't want to average those in. Well, they may be right or they may be wrong. History suggests that they're usually wrong when they make that claim but they might be right, but then turn attention to emerging markets. They're trading at 13 times their 10-year smooth earnings. Now, which, which set of economies is likely to have the faster growth in the years ahead? I'd place my money on emerging markets. So it seems to me that this is a very easy decision to make. We can also look for alpha. We can look for opportunities to move into um, smart beta strategies. I was listening to the panel on smart beta and it's correct to say that there's nothing smart about smart beta. Beta is simply beta. But it does not make sense necessarily to invest um, reflexively into an index that automatically holds more of a company simply because it's more expensive. Here we can see that on an all-world basis um, um, from 2000 to 2012, the MSCI Acqui Index would have given you a lofty 2.3%. FTSE Raffi All World, 7.5%, a 5% increment. For the U.S., S&P, 1.6%. Just equal weight those same 500 companies and you get 500 basis points more. Fundamentally, uh, invest and find the thousand largest businesses, weight them by the size of their business, and you get four and a half percent more. Using the emerging markets, we find that MSCI emerging markets gives you an 8.9 percent return fundamental index, a pretty impressive step up, an additional six and a half percent return. So the smart beta strategy is by contra trading against the market's most extreme bets and by not loading up on companies just because they're expensive also seem to offer us tools 
for ways to invest to improve our returns. In other words, there's a number of ways to improve our long-term returns. We can consider other asset classes. We can build a third pillar. We can use emerging market stocks and bonds. We can invest in alternative asset classes, uh, commodities, REITs, inflation-linked bonds, and so forth. The, the ETF arena is behind the curve on offering products in this space. Five years ago, the ETF community offered essentially nothing in this space. Now it's catching up, and thank goodness for that. You can seek alpha conservatively by trying to avoid negative alpha or aggressively if you believe that there are interesting paths to earn alpha. Again, the ETF community was profoundly behind the curve on this in its early days. Now it's catching up and catching up fast. You can actively manage the asset mix, but to do it profitably, you have to do it uncomfortably. Baron Rothschild famously said that the way to succeed in investing um, is to buy when there's blood in the streets. It's, his full quote is rarely cited. Hardly everyone hears the full sentence. He said, buy when there's blood in the streets, even when the blood is your own. Uh, the ETF marketplace affords us opportunities to consider other asset classes and to seek alpha. Active asset allocation, I know, is under consideration in the ETF community, and products are under design. Some fledgling products are already available. I think this is an area of rapid development. But investors need tools. They need tools that can help them prosper. What's readily available in the marketplace doesn't fully meet their needs. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to entertain any questions at this point. Rob, maybe I have a question for you. Um, what do you think, like, uh, for example, now um, you say, uh, like, the emerging markets value, technical, uh, in terms of value, it's probably rather undervalued, right, compared to U.S., for example. Yes. Um, do you think, like, yes. um, things will persist? That you, it's almost uh, like the question is, is the free lunch? Um, uh, this value because it, it's definitely also a risk factor. Uh, like it's not exactly clear how much is behind the risk. Do you think like there will be maybe coming up of uh, quite a value ETFs uh, more, and then this will slowly disappear? This advantage, or you think this will stay? The markets have like always the, provided in interesting investment opportunities, and they always will. Um, buy what's out of favor, buy what's uncomfortable to buy. Why are emerging markets cheap relative to the developed world, especially relative to the U.S. today? Well, the U.S. has been perceived as a safe haven. Perhaps uh, recent chaotic events in Washington will reshape that perspective, but who knows? Um, meanwhile, the emerging markets, well, there's blood in the streets. And with blood in the streets, with uh, tumult in various parts of the emerging markets, of course they've become cheap. It's the, it's the tumult that creates the bargains. Now that's not to say that bargains can't become cheaper bargains. And so when one buys bargains, one has to be prepared to shed a little of your own blood because you can't pick the bottom. The nature of contrarian investing is that you average in you buy when it's cheap, and if it gets cheaper, you buy more. Meanwhile, having shed some of your own blood on those first purchases that were too early before the bottom. And that's the uncomfortable part of uh, contrarian investing. Uh, that's why so many people do it so badly. So you think this uh, will probably persist, that they will not uh, be very efficient in doing this? Also in the future. Most, most investors are very bad at contrarian investing. They lose their nerve when results go against them. Um, um, consider, for example, that inflation hedges have been uh, have become a lot cheaper in the last six months as inflation fears have waned. Well, isn't that a great time to buy inflation hedges? 
at a time when central bankers all over the developed world are running the printing presses faster than ever. But inflation fears have waned because people are worried about weakening economy, uh, which is not inflationary. They're worried about deleveraging, which is not inflationary. And they're worried as a result about the risk of deflation. Well, um, uh, inflation does not pre-announce itself. And so my preferred approach is when inflation hedges are available cheap, I want to buy more inflation hedges because people aren't afraid of inflation. And so when it comes to buying tips at 1.5% in the U.S. versus buying them six months ago when they yielded 20 basis points, I'd rather buy them at 1.5%. It's not a great yield, but it's a lot better than 20 basis points. And so uh, we look around the marketplace and, and like to buy when things are out of favor and when there are more people thinking about lightening up than thinking about buying. Uh, what, what do you think, like, how much extra return uh, uh, could you take out of such a strategy like realistically over time like uh, over like 10 or 20 years like per year well thinking of those three paths to incremental return looking outside of mainstream investing in the uncomfortable markets that are not widely understood they're likely to be priced to offer a percent or more higher than mainstream markets looking for alpha, looking for managers and strategies with skill or structural alpha, which I think fundamental index captures, an ability to add an additional 1% or 2% there makes sense. Tactical contrarian investing, shifting money out of markets that are popular and beloved and into markets that are feared and loathed, it's wildly uncomfortable and therefore expecting to get paid an extra 1% or 2% for that fear factor makes sense. Well, that's three layers of 1% to 2%. Even if you take a conservative view that maybe you're going to get an extra 1% from each of those layers, you can improve your long-term returns by perhaps 3% a year. Over long periods of time, that compounds mightily. It's really an issue that the people go out of the markets at the wrong time. So um, considering that, you think it adds value. For example, if asset managers would like uh, uh, offer solutions where they would do um, something similar like you do, uh, mm. like systematically and basically um, communicate the strategy and then make sure and uh, talk with the client in bad times uh, that that uh, that uh, the client stays in the strategy. You think this is like something uh, adding value and something uh, making sense? I think it does. Um, you will have many clients who. Um, flee at exactly the wrong time and that's part of the nature of our business. Um, uh, one of my friends in the fund management business uh, likens it to breathing. You breathe in new clients and new assets and you breathe out the clients and assets that had no business buying in the first place. So then thank you a lot uh, Rob. And um, Thank you for including me yes, in the uh, wish you a nice day. All the best.